Let me make sure everything's running right right now. All right, all right, all right. Everything's together. It's just, you know, um, welcome to the last episode of Slumber Party ever. Not to fret, though. Not to worry. Um, I will be continuing to do my podcast. It just will go back to the unbothered brand. That's what's going to happen because Slumber Party was designed for... Me, Nick, and Hooch, who was otherwise known as the boss baby. And that was fun for that little while. But, you know, Nick has to do Austin comedy scene things, which I had kind of given him the axe anyway, because I know that when I'm going to blow everything up, a lot of the people around me will not be able to withstand the blast and I say that only half joking but it's true I know that different people have different opinions or ideas of what they want to do and they're not going to be ready for the kind of heat that I bring and I have been like that for my entire career I just well no I was very cool For probably the first seven years or so, I was kind of chill about everything. But then there came a point where I just really didn't care about a lot of people. And I think it was at that point that I realized that people weren't really worth anything anyway. And I don't mean that in a bad way. There are some good people. And I'm definitely not feeling like jaded or I I don't get like that about this. I'm very realistic about the way that I look at stand-up comedy and more importantly show business because for me they're almost two different things even though they're very closely related. Like I love stand-up. I absolutely love stand-up comedy but I do not love show business because with show business All the cliches you hear are true. And just to catch you guys up on the latest, apparently Red Band and Tony Hinchcliffe uh, let let comics know that uh, they're paying attention to who likes my Instagram post and my Instagram reels, which... I don't care about at all. I laughed when I was told that, but there's a couple of things that go with that that I'll tell you guys just really quick. One, you can tell people not to like my reels and my post, and that doesn't really matter because I've never relied on comics to be my audience anyway. And the other thing is, When you tell people not to like the things that are public, what that does is sends everybody to my stories. And no matter what you do, because people know that you can't see that, people are going to continue to go to my stories, which is a more effective delivery system for anything that I want to say or anything that I want to put out anyway. So it really isn't a smart play. I swear I almost feel like coaching them and telling them how to do what it is they're trying to do effectively. Because really, when you drive people to my stories, you're not going to be able to keep them out of there, just like you can't keep yourself out of my stories, Red Ben. I mean, because I check. (laughs) Not every day, but I mean, like, enough times, because I know that they try to keep an eye on things. And so Red Ben is always in my stories, and... Red Band, try to lie about that so I can just post screenshots because I will quickly. Everybody knows me. Everybody knows I will do that, which is like the other thing about it, you know, is like some people maybe feel like I um, am a little too quick to post screenshots. I don't care. I just, you know, if people are doing stupid things behind the scenes, I will just make that public sometimes. And I, I have no loyalty to show business in that way, you know, because the way that it's supposed to work, and if you guys ever wonder how things like Harvey Weinstein or Diddy or things like that happen, the way that they happen is because everybody knows those things are happening anyway. It's just once the general public finds out, everybody has to act like, oh, you mean that's happening? Like, Literally everybody knows that Mothership, Red Band, Adam Egget, uh, Tony Hinchcliffe, 
They are literally blackballing me as we speak. Everybody on the Austin comedy scene knows that. You guys know that. Anybody that's watched my podcast knows that. And nobody cares about it. But I guarantee you, when things happen the way that they happen, and they end up doing this to somebody that maybe has a little more pull or offers a little more consequence or maybe just cares more than I do because I think that's the other thing that's missing in the equation is that I don't care. I'm not like trying to make a thing of it. Yeah, I talk about it because to me, it's all kind of funny and it's all kind of ridiculous. And the number of people that, you know, would try to kind of say that they were my friends and, you know, act like they really cared about me. Um, they haven't turned out to be that, but I knew that anyway. I knew that that's what was around me. And like I've told you guys before, that's a good part of why I did this because I wanted to clear all that away from me. I Nothing grosses me out more then when people are around me that I can tell are just around me because of what I have access to or what they think I can offer them. That's like the worst feeling in the world to me because the other side of that is I have to pretend that I don't know and I have to be like, huh, yeah, I think you're funny. I think you're charming. I really like you. And it's like, but I don't. So, you know, that's what eventually happens with me like I've talked about before that I was an escort for a long time and I'll tell you guys why I eventually stopped being an escort um in my last year of that I made more money than I had ever made at any other point but I think that was because I knew that I was done with it. I always know internally or subconsciously, even if I don't outwardly express it or consciously know that that's what's happening, I always know subconsciously what's going on with me and what's about to happen. And so I made a bunch of money and I really literally just got tired of playing stupid because that's a lot of what that job is. I mean, you have to outsmart the person because it's sort of like gambling. And I wish that uh, producer Justin had given me that episode, but I can recreate it anytime I want to. It would be done with different words. But there was an episode where I really talked about that with both Little Nick and Hooch. And it was one that was just us four in the room. So me, producer Justin, uh, little Nick and Hooch and I was telling them about it and the way that that all works out is you never want to seem like you're not playing ball but there were always things that weren't on the table with me there were things that I wouldn't do I was the most do nothing escort you ever met in your life but I had a lot of regulars and people really did like me but uh, the way that that works is because you don't want to seem like you're just completely not playing ball is you have to size people up. And so if, you know, you if they ask you to do something that you don't want to do, you usually don't tell them that you just won't do that. What you'll do is you'll look at them and you'll be like, OK, I think this chump probably has X amount of dollars on them, right? Uh, so if you're looking at somebody that maybe isn't a chump, you know, probably has a decent amount of money, and you're like, this person probably has a thousand dollars that he'd be willing to give. So you just say that it's fifteen hundred dollars for what it is they want, and then they're like, well, I have a thousand, and you're like, well, it would be fifteen, so. I can't do that, but what I will do for a thousand is this. And so that's usually the way it works out. And so um, at a point, though, because what people like, especially because different escorts sell different things, right? There's some people that they look at and all they want is just straight up fornication. <laughs> That's what they want. 
But with me, because I was like very young looking and I started when I was super young too, um, it was more of like, and this is going to sound creepy, but it's just true and what the game was. Um, it was more like they wanted innocence from me. And so with me, the more I said no, the more money I made because that's kind of what they wanted from me anyway. And so, but at the same time, you know, because you always say, well, if you're a person like me um, working my angle, you always said that you are younger than you actually were. And so um, part of that, you know, being younger is being more naive and being more dumb. And so I just had to play dumb all the time and I just got tired of it eventually. And there was one time that I finally, you know, yelled at one person and it was because he was really trying to get over on me. And what he was trying to do was literally pressure me into doing things that I didn't want to do because he had given me not even a lot of money. Like that was a base call was what he had done. And so this was in Las Vegas and he tried to tell me, he was like, he was like, you're cheating me right now. That's what you're doing is you're cheating me. And so I finally got tired of him. And you know, cause when I would do calls, I would lower my voice a little bit. And because that was the other thing people wanted from me was people wanted to be, wanted me to be more on the masculine side, right? And so I don't consider my natural voice to be that masculine. So I would speak in a lower voice and I just gave up my real voice at that t at that point and just told him, look, you and I both know the way this works. This is Las Vegas and this is the way it goes. You know that you don't get what you're asking for, for what I come here for. That's not the way this works at all. And I'm not going to play this game with you. And so. That's, you know, like that was the beginning of the end for me. And, you know, I went through with that the way that I wanted to go through with it with that particular guy as well, because I wasn't trying to cheat him at all. I was doing things exactly the way that I was supposed to do them. By the time this had happened, I had already been escorting for several years. And so I knew what was me cheating people and what was not me and what was not cheating people. And the thing with the way that that all plays out is that if you're coming from another city, you may be used to that, but in those other cities, those were the days when people were actual hustlers on the streets. And so if you're dealing or trying to compare me, and I'm not trying to be shitty with anybody right now, but if you're trying to compare me to some $50 hustler that you deal with in Wichita, Kansas, that is not at all what my operation was about. And I do mean operation because I had actual ads and there was a whole way everything worked out with me. And I was really good at that job, you know, and some people don't consider it a job like they think that that's what it is. It's just you might as well be working the street. And I don't know who you guys know that's like that but I can tell you who wasn't like that. And now I stay away from all that. Once I started doing stand-up, then I completely, well, not completely. There, I used to do a joke about it because, you know, I looked at it as the universe offering me money. And so sometimes I'd be in some like weird <laughs> sleazy situation and somebody would offer me money. And I would I'll, always, even to this day, because I joke, but I don't joke, you know, because <laughs> I tell people all the time, some nights I can't give it away, but I can always sell it. And it's because... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I go to the bar and I'd be like just hanging out at the bar, the club, just being me, having fun and that kind of stuff. And I wouldn't see anybody that I was interested in, like in a personal way, you know, and then I wouldn't have anybody approaching me in that way either. Oh, there's always going to be some guys that are like somewhat near me, which like that's something that uh, my co-producers found out when I was doing the 
la my festival laughed out. Um, my co-producers were Jocelyn and Steven. And they like we would have our meetings at gay bars, you know, because we were doing a queer comedy festival and that gave us a chance to network with the bartenders a little bit and tell them about the the comedy festival that was coming up. And also, you know, we'd have like a drink or two. I I haven't really been a drinker for several years now, even back then. That was 2020 when we did that. I think it was December of 2020 or no. Uh, it was going to be January of 2020 was when it was. Well, it was January of 2020, but it was um, like late 2019 that we were planning everything. And so we were going to the bars and stuff like that. And even back then, I wasn't really drinking, but I would have like a Midori sour and Amaretto sour. And always there would be old men that would come up to me and try to talk with me there was one his name was paul and my friends made fun of me because he was really trying to flirt with me but i was trying to have this meeting with them and i was serious about it because i was the creator of that festival i actually ran a comedy festival which is pretty impressive and it made money which everybody will tell you comedy festivals don't make money the first year you do them and i was like no 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 margie this festival will make money and so it made money for all of us and then we had money for the following year like some to start us up for the following year but then you know the big shutdown happened and that made it so eventually my co-producers hit me up and were like, hey, you know, we still have that money. Do you just want to split it three ways? We'll give you more, obviously. Um, and so we did that. But there was one day in particular where this old guy, Paul, was like harassing me and he just kept trying to harass me and he could clearly see that I was having this meeting. <laughs> And so I was trying to be as nice as possible. And I just was like, oh, Paul. <laughs> and so that became like a running line with my co-producers where they just go, oh, Paul, at different points. But yeah. And so um, so my point is show business and all that has gotten kind of like that with me now where or I've gotten that way with show business where I just don't take it seriously. And I felt like I was having to dumb it down a bit. And here in Austin, especially because I was doing so much stuff and I told you guys that I've told you I or I've told you guys that I will tell you guys about the different cities and what happened with me in the different cities because people love to paint it like you got chased out of LA and then you got chased out of Phoenix and then you got chased out of Las Vegas and it's like I have not been chased out of anywhere let me tell you guys the way it works city by city LA was really great when I first got there. The way that the system worked out there was really easy to navigate. That's when like open mics were, uh, and this is when I first got there, so like 2003. Open mics were you sign up, you go up, and it wasn't what it turned into eventually. Towards the end of me being in LA, there were buckets and then so you'd put your name in a bucket and sometimes they'd have a rolling bucket which is where they pull the names throughout the show sometimes they'd pull the names at the beginning but that got on my nerves but a lot of people would rig buckets for me you know would make sure that i got in where i was supposed to i was a regular a paid regular at every club in la except for the comedy store that was the only one that i was not a paid regular at but big or small including comedy and magic club which is technically known as a clean club i used to kill it at comedy and magic club regularly um, and the one day I'll tell you guys a story about the way I got in there. It's pretty simple the way the story went, but I feel like I shouldn't veer too much from what I'm trying to do because we all know how much I talk and I might run out of time, but, um, and I don't want to do more than an hour today. I think I told you guys at the beginning, but it is now 8.02 AM is what it is. And this is 
Saturday morning, the end of Friday night for me. I've been editing all night and I feel really good about everything because I got plenty of sleep. I haven't eaten as much as I should yet, but I'll probably have a quick something. I've been doing a lot of that lately where I haven't been eating as much as I should. I've been going to the gym like crazy, though, because to me, self-discipline in this particular time is the most important thing. I got asked to do a show last night. I've been asked to do a couple shows around town recently. But I either don't return messages or I politely decline. And if anybody's watching that has sent me a message asking me to do a show, it's nothing personal and I'm not being snotty with you by not returning your messages. I'm just really staying on task right now and doing what it is that I have to do because I feel like the things that I have to do right now are more important than any local show that I would be doing. And I really don't have an interest in being out. Last week I did, uh, I went to go watch, uh, not watch, I was supposed to do a set on Alex Stein show, which Alex Stein, if you're not familiar with him, he's got a pretty popular YouTube. Well, it's actually a very popular YouTube and I like him a lot and we have a good relationship and I had done a guest set at one of his other shows and so he had hit me up a while back and asked me if I wanted to do a show because I'm just running the way that I run though I ended up getting there super late this last time and he still wanted to get me on but a lot of the other comics were running the light. And I just wanted to leave because and it was nothing against him and I didn't feel any way about the way anything was going. There was no what's it was at Vulcan and uh, I saw it like that's the other thing like I went to Vulcan and all the same people that used to talk to me before were talking to me now. So I don't know how effective this like blackballing is going but it's not i don't think it's what they want it to be but anyway i'm trying to get somewhere here so what happened was i decided to leave because leonarda was there and she had a set that was going to be at the green room so i ran out to the green room with leonarda which the green room is i think in north austin i'm terrible with directions it's a cool spot, though, and I've headlined it a few times, and I have a really good relationship with those people. But I went and hung out there with Leonardo because I just felt like it was a good time to, one, have a chat with Leonardo because she's been in and out of town a lot lately. And also, I didn't really feel like going up. Even, like, I feel like I'm manifesting every single thing that I want, and it's going really well. But at the same time, I got to be careful because... um. Like you ever feel like you're manifesting things, <laughs> you're manifesting everything you want. So you really have to be careful what you tell the universe. Like uh, earlier today, I was doing my hair. I, when I mean earlier today, I mean right before I recorded this because I had taken a shower last night and then was like, let me just edit. And so I was had my hair kind of messy. You know, I had blow dried it, but I hadn't put any product in it. And so it was wild. And so I had to flat iron it. And I was when I was flat ironing it, I remember having a quick second where I was like, I wish I didn't have so much hair. And I was like, don't think that. Because <laughs> the way that things have been just happening for me the way that I want them to happen I got to be careful what I say to the universe because I'll wake up bald headed tomorrow because I said that I <laughs> wish I didn't have so much hair so I, I uh, don't do it universe um but anyway um yeah and so last night I was asked to do a show but I um or just go hang out if I wanted to. I could either do a set or just hang out. And there was a part of me that thought about it. But then I remembered that I had grounded myself. Because I really wanted to get that particular video that I was editing out, out. And so it'll be coming out at 11 a.m. today. But... It was a lot on the editing part and it was because I do everything stream of conscious st stream of consciousness and so I will just talk and then in editing that's where I'll rearrange everything and make it all say it in the order that I want to say it. All God damn it, who's bugging me right now? I can't imagine why anybody would be messaging me at this hour. It's 8.07 a.m. 
that's somebody that's going to get yelled at. Um, but what I was trying to get to was what happened with me in the different cities. So, uh, I was grounded last night. I was being good like that. So LA was great when I first got there and I was a regular at every club and, what happened was I was very vocal about the fact that I was voting for Donald Trump, which to me was very fun. Like the whole I've been to several Trump rallies now. I don't know if I'll go to any Trump rallies this time around, but it's just because it's a time investment, you know, and I am like in those situations, too. I'm good at getting where I want to be. And um People really like me at the Trump rallies because I don't look like your typical Trump supporter. And so there will be a lot of people that even if they don't know I'm a comedian, they want to take pictures with me. And this was before I had as many face tattoos as I have now. But um, yeah, and so it's super fun to go to the Trump rallies and be a part of that. And it really pissed a lot of people off, though, because I was living in L.A., obviously. And so there were a lot of that's when woke was really becoming a thing, because you got to remember, this was Trump when he first ran. So 2015, I think that was um, was when the campaign was happening. And I was vocal. I was like a Trump supporter from the beginning, the beginning. So I caught all the smoke and I was ready for it. I was so good at making people look stupid online because these people all operate from emotion, which is something that you'll notice is a pattern with me and people is if you guys haven't figured out my game, I don't mind telling you because most people won't be smart enough to employ it anyway. But my thing is people are very angry with me when they're dealing with me. And so they make dumb decisions and they do things in a very stupid way. And me, because I don't care about anything and that's genuinely the way I feel, I just am able to very logically take them apart and make them look silly um, because... I don't have the emotion for it that they have. So um, because I was good at that, though, a lot of different outlets were interviewing me and there were, um, you know, there were constant arguments, though, with people that were um, like because that's when woke was first becoming a thing. I remember the first time I heard the term woke and just being like it was from this trans woman. Uh, and believe me, I don't feel that, I don't feel that way about all trans people. But this trans woman was just a beast of a person that always had a stubble. Her name was Olivia Hader, and she no longer does comedy. All the people that I got into it back then no longer do comedy. So that tells you the level of idiot that I was dealing with. But. They were really fun to make look stupid. And like I said last week, because I've hung out with trans women for so long, when trans people come at me sideways, it's very easy for me to get under their skin. It's very easy for me to use old school trans language and tactics to just read the shit out of them because it's like second nature to me because I've been doing it for so long. And so when you consider that most people like Olivia Hader, I think she had been, you know, living as a woman for like two years, maybe. Or and then there was Riley Jess Silverman was another one, otherwise known as Rye Silverman, that was always trying it with me. And I was just so good at reading them. And I was good at that with pretty much everybody. And so all the real comics in L.A., were um, very supportive of what I was doing and would have a good time with it because I was so fun about it. And then that's when I started identifying as trans was right around that time too, which was also a fun, <laughs> a fun thing to do. I tell you guys, I was a groundbreaking bitch. When I was a trans woman, I became the first ever trans woman to be a judge of the roast battle at the world famous comedy store. Thank you, Brian Moses. 
I became the first trans woman ever to host the potluck of the world famous comedy store in the original room. I uh, I did kind of a lot of things as a trans woman. I can't even remember all my accomplishments um, as a woman. And then I detransitioned for a while. And keep in mind, my version of transitioning was since nobody else was trying, neither was I. So I stayed exactly the way I am now and was just identifying as a trans woman. And so then I detransitioned at a point and then I transitioned back. But I didn't detransition until I left LA. But anyway, what happened was eventually, because I was going on the road so much, there were kind of a couple things happening. And I'm probably one of the few people that's ever left LA while having heat, as they would say, because a lot of people were still interested in me at that time, industry, industry wise. But the problem was, for me, the problem was the part of the industry or the people that were interested in me were people that were definitely on the right. And one thing that I found out in being a Trump supporter in L.A. was that a lot of the people that you think are liberal are lying to you and they will pull a person like me aside and say, hey, I would never say this publicly because I want to continue to work and I don't want people giving me problems, but I'm voting for Donald Trump too. And I love that you're saying the things you're saying. And so that was very eye-opening for me and very fun. And I, so, and for as much as people think like, oh, he gets mad and he'll just start outing people and saying these things. I don't think I've outed a single person that's ever told me anything like that. I just don't, um, it, there's nothing that like, you know, me outing people to me isn't even outing people. It's like if you do something nice for me and I take a picture with you and then say, hey, this person is very nice and did this thing for me. I love this person. You would think that's cool, right? You wouldn't think that's a violation of privacy. But then you do something shitty directly to me and I decide to screenshot that and make that public and suddenly now I'm violating privacy. Well, neither are personal for me. So it just is what it is and that's the way I feel about it. But let me know in the comments if you guys think that I'm betraying trust. Um, but anyway, so what happened was it wasn't the kind of heat that I wanted was the truth about that. So that really didn't factor in for me in a huge way. And there were people that were very nice to me and very supportive of me. And I got booked on a lot of things. I'll tell you where bookings got canceled. It was on a election night that bookings got canceled for me because leading up, it's all fun and games until Hillary doesn't win because that's the thing. There were some people that were booking me just because I was funny because I had some really good jokes about voting for Trump and kind of making fun of the whole liberal side and that kind of stuff. And so I was legitimately getting booked because I was funny. But then I would get asked to do these like panels and debates and shows like that. And I was really good at that and really fun and entertaining about it. Because again, other people would be mad about it and then I'd just be having fun. So there was that part of it that was good. And I made good money and Russell Simmons, that's right before he got canceled and he had me do Roast of America. That's one that surprisingly, even though it wasn't a lot of places because it was shot for all deaf digital, they paid me really well, though, for that one little day. And then they also had me do the all deaf digital movie awards. And then Russell Simmons got canceled because he got caught up on some Me Too stuff that some people still say is BS. And I don't really know in that way. My relationship with Russell Simmons was very non-existent, but also very supportive at the same time. He had talked about me on the morning news when he was promoting Roast of America. He didn't mention me by name, though. He just mentioned that I was a very funny comic that was the only Trump supporter on the Roast of America. 
And it, like, you know, I understood why he was the way he was. Also, there have always been rumors about Russell Simmons being gay. And I know that a lot of times, because I've had this happen a lot in my career, a lot of times when there are rumors that somebody's gay, um, if they're around me, or I should say if I'm around them, they will not take pictures with me and they will not be seen talking to me publicly. So Russell Simmons did tell me person to person before that I that he thought I was very funny and he really liked my stuff because the way the day of that taping went was nobody wanted to talk to me the day of the taping. Donnell, Ryle, Donnell Rollins, Dominique, Diana Hong, uh, I think that's her name, she talked to me uh, because we had known each other from Comedy Magic Club and some other spots. Maybe it's not Diana Hong. Am I racist if I say another Asian person's name? But um, I think it was Diana Hong. She, but she was, uh, you know, she was the only Bernie supporter on the roast, on the dais. And... Uh, who else didn't talk to me? None of them talked. Orny Adams, who some people have an opinion about that's not the nicest. Me and Orny have always been super cool, and he's always been super nice. And so when I saw Orny Adams was there, right away we, you know, like were hanging out and being cool. And so he was the only person that made me feel welcomed there at all. Oh, Ida Rodriguez, who, you know, was the person that booked me on it and has been my friend for a long time. She, I have some opinions about her political opinions, and one day I'm going to make a video about it, but I think Ida will know how to take it because Ida knows how to take me. But Ida was very supportive. You see her being very cool. And then the host for the show, I can't remember his name, but he was very, very cool. He was on The Wire. I wish I could remember his name. No disrespect to anybody if I'm not mentioning your name right now. Not that those people are watching, but... You know, the way everybody's acting now, they might go back and he didn't even remember your name. And it's like, yeah, I don't remember people's names. That's normal. And so um, so my point is that was all really great. Right. Dealing with that part of it. But then there were at the same time the woke people that would get in groups and they try to get my shows canceled or get me taken off things. There was one LGBT specific show. It was like a pride show and they started this whole campaign and they like kind of scared the producers and then the producers tried to cancel me like the day before and I was like, well, you're still going to have to pay me for the show and I'm going to just go down there and make sure that you guys pay me as the show's happening or right before the show. And if there's people protesting, I'm going to show them my check and I'm going to thank them for making it so that I got paid but still didn't have to work. And so they were like, we'll call you back. And so uh, they called me back and they were like, all right, we're going to have you on the show. And I started the show by telling the audience there that was an LGBT audience that people were trying to get me canceled off the show because they said I was racist, homophobic, transphobic. And I plan to prove to you guys that I'm all of those things in that set. And that saying that alone killed it and then from there i just killed it killed it killed it and then uh it was such a great set i still have the video i just saw it the other day um and then uh mitch o'farrell who was the what's it called of that district the councilman of that district i believe it was what he was he uh, might still be but he was he gave me an award um, that night, which I have on my wall right now because I like that so much that after people try to get me canceled, I got, and so I posted a picture of me shaking hands with him and I was like, you bitches are going to fuck around and get me a key to the city. And, uh, but my point was, um, then I was doing the road a lot, which had already started ramping up and was like that for kind of a like a year or two before that that I was because you know I was doing the road with Joe Coy for um up until like kind of recently before that and then Gabriel Iglesias was shortly after that and like but doing the road that way it was like I was constantly flying and then I started doing the road, the road, which I've told you guys about, which wasn't a glamorous version of the road. And so I started doing that version of the road and it was exhausting. 
And so I was paying L.A. rent, and I would come back. Me and Bijou were going everywhere together at that time. That's when Bijou really was my road dog. I tell you, that little dog has earned her stripes with me, and if she wants to stay home every day of her life for the rest of her life, she can do that because she was on the road with me so much during that time. Me and Bijou went everywhere together. And, we, you know, I'd fly some places, and I'd have Bijou – get a babysitter and then I went to China for the first time during that time I think first and second time was my last two years in LA I think that's the way that worked out maybe um but anyway so I was doing so much of the road and it was one of those situations where I got like okay so I have people here that are constantly complaining about I don't know what. And I am getting attention from the industry, but it's the kind of attention that I don't want because nothing against anybody. And I love all my conservative and right wing friends very much. And they've been very supportive with me. And I have no plans of abandoning those people or those friendships in any way a lot of them have lasted until this day but the last thing i wanted to do was become a specifically right-wing comedian because anytime you commit to something like that then you have to always think from that point of view and whether or not you're going to make those people happy or if the things you say are going to make them mad and so right now i'm just a hundred percent me and on certain things i agree with people that would be considered more liberal and on most things i agree with people that are conservative or right or center right and uh, I, you know, and I like that freedom. And so I didn't want to do that. So that wasn't an option for me, even though it was an option that was on the table. It wasn't an option for me. And so I put it all together and got like, I'm paying L.A. rent, which I did love my apartment, but I was still paying L.A. rent for it. Um, I'm paying L.A. rent. I'm dealing with L.A. traffic. And I'm not really trying to be an industry comic at this point. Like, you know, I wasn't interested in the other side of industry and I, I'm making nice with them and, you know, caring about the way they felt about Donald Trump and he's whatever. I don't care. I just don't care. The last thing I want to hear is losers whine because that's what happened is Hillary lost. You guys lost. It's what it was. I don't want to hear you, bitch. And so and I certainly don't want to be your shoulder to cry on. And I certainly don't want to lie to you and be like, oh, yeah, it was all like a fever dream. I don't know what I was thinking by voting for Donald Trump. But he's there. And like one of the jokes that I did, like right after he won is like everybody's bummed out. But we won, you guys. And people got a lot of laughs off of it. But like I said, uh, election night, because everybody had planned to have me come out. You know, I was booked on four shows election night. And three of them got canceled. And it was because people were having serious Trump derangement syndrome. That's when that really started. And so they were, you know, because I was listening. I had done Irvine. No, two of them got canceled because I had done Irvine. But that was for Comedy Juice and was nothing political. And so I had done Irvine. And then I had three shows in Hollywood. One of them was at the improv and everybody was such a wreck. And this was election night. So I'm listening and they're, you know, saying what's happening. Like as far as the votes coming in, that's happening. And I'm listening to that on the radio. And so just as this is going on, people are texting me or calling me and being like, Hey, don't bother coming after all. And like that kind of thing. And so, um, so I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to leave LA. You know, I mean, like, that's what it was, was I decided to leave and I didn't make a big thing of it. I didn't have like a big party or, you know, but like, like I said, every real comic and even a lot of the open bikers and stuff like that were like super cool with me. So they were bummed when I left. And so I just went to Phoenix because I didn't know where I wanted to go next, but I knew that I didn't want to be in L.A. anymore. For me, that was done. And originally moving to L.A., one day we'll talk about that. But 
there there was never a thing where I wanted to be in LA like that. LA was necessary for me, and I don't regret a minute of the. Um, I don't regret a minute of it. I was there for 14 years, and when I was ready to go, I was just ready to go. And so, like I said, I didn't make a big thing of it. I maybe told people that I was leaving the week of or whatever, and I had done everything right, you know, as far as giving my apartments 30 days, my apartment 30 days notice, and I'd done everything the way that I was supposed to, so I knew that I was going to leave long before I had told anybody who I was going to leave, but I didn't want to make a big thing of it. I wasn't, I wasn't feeling like a, you know, a long goodbye was in order or whatever, or a big whatever. It was like, we're all comics, and I'll see you guys again, so... It is what it is. But, you know, I kind of left L.A. a little bit of a hero because I was so hardcore and just being me. And a lot of people respected that because I was doing that in L.A., a city where everybody bends and basically does what they're told. And so when I went to Phoenix, I ended up being there for only about a year, but well, just under a year, like a month under a year or something like that. I think it was. But um. The thing with Phoenix was I knew when I was going there that I was just going to go there and figure out where I was going to go next. I knew that I wasn't going to live in Phoenix forever. I wanted to be close to my family for a little while, too, because I had been away from them. Because, you know, I would go back because it's only a five hour drive from L.A. to Phoenix and I would go back a lot, you know, at points. So sometimes, you know, not at all. And then sometimes I'd spend like, you know, one time I think I spent like two months there or something like that and just did a couple gigs that I had to do on the road. But, um, you know, I wanted to be close to my family for a little while. And so I went and I did that. And Phoenix was the most everybody's fighting over absolutely no money city ever. And it's where some people pulled the dumbest shit that I've ever seen comics pull in my life before. Um, and I ended up finding out from one of my friends the way that all went down. And I confronted them about it because what happened was the LGBT center had burnt down in Phoenix. And, you know, with the Phoenix gay community... I have a good relationship, I would say, you know, as far as that part of the Phoenix gay community goes, you know, the people that run stuff like that. And I felt like me being a Phoenix comic that, you know, did because, you know, I mean, like when I do Phoenix, when I do stuff there, a lot of times that stuff really does sell out and more recently sells out fast. And so. Um, but you know, this was that in between time and I knew that people knew me and stuff like that. And so I offered to do a show, but I not the person that's going to produce that, you know, that wasn't going to be my thing. And so one of my friends, Krangus is his name. He said that he would hook that up. And so he, you know, talked to the LGBT center and then he talked to one of the local bars. I think it was Stacy's, which is a lesbian bar that he had, you know, arranged it with. And so, you know, obviously I'm going to headline it because it was my idea. And so he was like talking to me about it. And I was like, hey, there's two comics that I would like you to hit up to see if they can do it. And their names were Ernesto and Gene. Ernesto and Gene are two gay comics in the Phoenix scene. And do you know when Krangus went to Ernesto and Gene, because I told him to or had asked him to, um, he went to them to book them for this show. They told him that he should not have me on the show and told him a bunch of lies about like I wasn't allowed at the Laugh Factory or the improv because of my views on LGBT and because I was a Trump supporter. And none of that is true. Technically, I had to have a talk with Jamie Masada, who's the owner of the Laugh Factory, because for a minute there, he was only putting me on the gay show, which was called Cirque du So Gay. Ridiculous name. But uh, he would only have me on the LGBT show in Long Beach. And before that, you know, because there was a point where 
Jamie was very, very interested in me as a comic and he was putting me on everything. And then at one point he got on my nerves, which is between me and him. He knows that I talked about it before, probably on one of my podcasts. Um, but I know for sure on a podcast, I just don't know which one of my podcasts it was, but you know, Jamie got on my nerves and he knew it. And so he was going through a little period where he was punishing me. So he would only have me on the gay show for that little while. And so I eventually talked to him about it and then he put me on the Latino show as well. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, laugh factory, like I said, is one of the clubs and that, that I had the best relationship with. Technically they were my home club. And then when it came to the Hollywood Improv. Hollywood Improv was booking me all the time right before I left. So it wasn't like anything they were saying was true. And so I confronted Gene about it because he was the one that was really saying it. Him and Ernesto are best friends. And he apologized for it. And then shortly after, he went right back to lying about me again. So you know, um, it, while I was in Phoenix, that's when I ended up meeting the guy that I referred to at the time as my silly boyfriend. And we ended up like being together and he had told me that, uh, you know, one of the few cities that he would consider moving to was Las Vegas. And he said that just by, you know, just through conversation when we were first getting together, not realizing that, you know, I had lived in Las Vegas when I was younger. And that was a place that I would be open to living again. And so I don't. Oh, I went there to work for a week at the L.A. Comedy Club. And while I was there, my best friend featured for me. My best friend at the time featured for me. And we were talking about it. And he was like. Um, this would be a perfect city for us to live in. And so originally my best friend was supposed to move there kind of right after I was. And this was in like October that I was doing this. And by Thanksgiving, um, I had decided that I was going to move there or I moved there, you know, cause I had decided in between. And I told the guy that I was dating who eventually became my fiance. I told him that that's what I was thinking about doing and he was down to do it. And so he made all the arrangements with his work so that he could transfer over there. And then I was running back and forth, like getting us an apartment and that kind of stuff, you know, like. Um, I went to go look at apartments and then I found one and that's the one that I ended up living for almost the whole time I was in Las Vegas. But, um, you know, that's the way that worked out. I didn't, there were a lot of people that I didn't like in Phoenix just because, and it, this is a hundred percent just what it was, is it was exactly like I said, a lot of people fighting over no money. And that's what that scene really is known for now. It really is just a toxic, toxic scene. And like very few good things have come out of that scene. You know, Jetski Johnson was there and Chappelle Lacey were both there. Um, right around the time that I was there, they or I got there, they were leaving. Chappelle went to L.A. shortly after, and I think Jetski went to L.A. shortly after I got to Phoenix as well. And so, you know, that scene was toxic on so many levels, and I am fun at dealing with that. And so I will admit that with the Phoenix scene, I kind of batted, batted them around like a ball of yarn. And then when I got bored with them and hit it to Las Vegas. So then Vegas was great for a little while. And that was like, you know, that situation. Um, but Phoenix was the same deal, like where I just decided I was going to leave and I left, you know, I didn't tell them I was going to leave. I just <laughs> but one day me and my silly boyfriend packed up all our stuff and took off to Vegas, you know, and like I said, it was like, I think the last day of November that we officially got there. Obviously, I had possession of the apartment from like the second week in November, I think it was because I remember on Thanksgiving Day, right after we had dinner with my uncle, I told my boyfriend like let's load up my car and I'll go and so I loaded up my car he had his car in Phoenix obviously and so I loaded up my car I flew back 
I rented a U-Haul. Um, you know, he picked me up from the airport. I flew into Scottsdale Airport, which I've never done before, but I flew into the Scottsdale Airport. And uh, then he drove the U-Haul and I drove his car, you know, after we loaded it up. And we had just moved into that that apartment. And it was a really nice apartment in Phoenix, but we had just moved in there um, like maybe September. Yeah. And so I had to pay a what's it called fee, like a early termination fee for my apartment. But I was so happy to be moving and, you know, I felt like that was going to be good and it was good for a while. And, you know, then eventually what happened with Vegas was I was there and everything was going great and I coaxed uh <laughs> And harassed some comics to move there. And because I was trying to figure that scene out because I really was thinking like this is a scene that needs to be built and can be built. But it turned out that too many of the comics in Vegas are more worried about partying and that kind of stuff. And then I got into it with Trix, who was a joke thief. And I talked about that on an episode, which you can watch that on one of the first episodes of Slumber Party if you want to see the way that story played out. But he was a joke thief and that turned into a thing. And then there were a couple other idiots that got on my fucking nerves. And um, then I just started to not like that scene. You know, I just didn't like being in Vegas anymore, but I was still just going to stay there because it was, you know, just a place to chill. And I really wasn't thinking about leaving anywhere. You know, I was running an open mic there and that was super fun. And I had uh, my mic that I would shit on people with, but I didn't like the scene anymore. You know, I mean, there's a few comics and it's like that for real, even now. Where, you know, I just had a uh, late night dinner with my friend Rob Falco because he was in town checking out Austin like maybe three or four nights ago and he hit me up. And I like Rob. I like Rob and his best friend is a guy named Gavin Monaco. And those guys are like real to me. I mean, like, you know, not to me. They're just real guys. And so like those two, I will probably always in my life make time for I mean as long as they choose to do stand-up or you know we choose to you know be in the same industry on any level but Rob Falco hit me up uh, late night the other night and technically I was grounded that night too but I was like you know I haven't seen Rob in long enough and so we went to Denny's late night and had a good conversation and that I do not regret at all I really did enjoy having that dinner with Rob Falco but there's probably three comedians that I talked to from last maybe four um also Landry and again in that city too like all the real comics in that city still uh, are cool with me and I'm still cool with them. You know, I guess I just don't think of them as active parts of the scene because in Vegas, what happens is a lot of people use it as a base and then just go on the road a lot, which is kind of what I was doing for a while there until COVID. Well, I guess we're not, I don't know. I don't know what the rules are on saying that in YouTube, but you know, till the big shutdown happened and then that put a stop to a lot of things but I was fine when that happened too there were parts at when that happened where because you know I was still getting along with everybody there and I was super popular in Vegas until I got tired of people because there I got tired of people too you know because people would just pull stupid things you know and that's when again election season started up and people started trying to get me canceled and whatever which will always be ineffective and people have realized that when you try to get me canceled it just makes me like more notorious and the people that like me really just stick with me even more so that's an ineffective thing to do um but people are welcome to do it i don't care um but so then one day i was uh on the road with tim dylan it was when we were in san jose and he had told me about Austin and asked me if I thought about checking it out. He's like, 
excuse me. He was like, don't you think you've probably done everything you want to do in Vegas at this point? And I was like, yeah, maybe. And he was like, look, you can stay in my guest house. Bring, talk it over with Bijou. That's the way he literally told me. He was like, talk it over with Bijou. See what's going on. And at first in my head, I was like, I'm not going to Austin. And, uh, but I was still hearing Tim out because, you know, Tim is such a, logical and smart guy that if he says anything to me i'm definitely going to listen to it at least so it wasn't like i was being dismissive in any way but just in my head i was like i'm probably not going to move to austin and he was like well if you get a chance check it out whatever whatever you know you can stay in the guest house so then i realized that i had a gig in el paso coming up in like september you know, and I think that when me and Tim were doing that, that was either July or August. And I'd seen Tony at the what's it called when uh, I went to go see Brian Simpson perform at MGM Grand when they were in Las Vegas. And there me and Tony had had a good conversation. And he was like, if you end up in austin at any point hit me up and you can do my show and then i told you guys that story like i didn't originally know what show he was talking about or that he was talking about kill tony and i wasn't really paying attention like that so i didn't know kill tony had even gotten as big as it had gotten to that point um but i had you know had tony's back when they were trying to cancel him and i was very vocal about that and so, you know, when uh, I f realized that I was supposed to be in El Paso at that particular time, then I was like, OK, well, let me hit Tim up and ask him if I can still stay in his guest house. I told him which week it would be because the plan was I was going to go to El Paso. Then I would drive to Austin. I didn't realize how far Austin is from El Paso. I thought it was going to be closer. Texas is huge, which I know that but I'm a dummy and I never check anything out. And so my feature was going to be a guy named Bruce. I can't remember Bruce's last name, but I love him. He's an actual friend of mine. He's one of the people that I should probably text after I'm done here. He works nights, so I'll text him right after I'm done with this podcast, which is going to be very soon. But um, I uh, was going to have Bruce feature for me so i told bruce well if you want to you can drive out to el paso with me and then you can fly home and i will just continue on to austin and i didn't realize like i said how far away it was and i didn't realize how far it was back to vegas i had a gig booked in las vegas immediately after i had to be here and it was a gig that was paying well i wish i could remember what it was because, I mean, like, I definitely had to be there. So, where I had planned to spend several days here in Austin, it turned out that I was only going to be able to spend two or three days here in Austin. And so, um, I drove out to Austin. I did kill Tony. I did a couple other things. I impressed a lot of people, and that's not me bragging. Anybody that was here will know, will tell you that. Well, maybe if they're allowed to if they're allowed to remember me. Um, but yeah, I, um, I did really well here and then I just liked it. And I was in my head on day two, uh, I was walking Bijou, uh, and I was like, you know, I'm going to check out apartments. I'm going to move to Austin. So I checked out apartments and then, like I said, that was like September. And then I ended up moving again. I ended up moving in. Uh, it was right after Thanksgiving. I guess Thanksgiving is always when I move now. Um, so maybe next Thanksgiving I'll move somewhere else. I don't know. Uh, and I don't have any plans of leaving Austin. But also... I'm very honest with everybody about the way that I am, you know, or anybody that knows me knows that I don't, um, I feel a commitment to a place for as long as I live there. And I, as long as I feel like that place is serving me. And then once that's not the case, then I will find myself somewhere else. And so for right now, I really do like Austin, the city. 
I don't want to function within the Austin comedy scene at this particular point. Maybe at some point I'll decide to go out again. But for right now, that's just not where my thinking is. I'm supposed to do uh, Roscoe's Cinco de Mayo. So the day that this comes out, if YouTube will let it come out on that particular day, um, I'm supposed to do a set for Willie Barsena because I really like Willie Barsena. I really respect him. He's a person that we are very similar in the way that once we decide we don't like something or somebody, then we're just clear about that. And so Willie hit me up out of nowhere and was like, do you want to do a set on my Cinco de Mayo show? And I was like, yeah, I would love to. And me and Willie have always had a good relationship, so I'm going to do a set on his show. But that is the only thing that I have planned in Austin coming up. And outside of that, I just want to continue to be in my own world. And I do a lot of working out and I do a lot of meditating. And when I do eat, I eat the things that I'm supposed to be eating. And I need to get better about that. And I need to start tracking my calories. And I journal and, you know, I hang out with my dogs. And um, right now I have to say that I like my life in its own bubble the way that it is. I don't at all regret any of the decisions that I've made recently because it really has let me completely focus on me and what I consider is the most important in my life right now and I know a lot of people won't get that but I think if a lot of people were to have walked through my life with me this far and I don't mean just the comedy part I mean the entire span of my life I don't think a lot of people would understand why I've done a lot of the things that I've done but all I know is that every single thing I've done has led to me being in a better position for myself and me getting to know myself better and relying on myself more and more and not really thinking about the outside world that much. And in a lot of cases, when people think that I've thrown away certain opportunities or that I maybe haven't done things in the smartest way, they haven't seen the other side and how smart it was for me as a person or how important it was for me as a person because I am the kind of person that once I don't like something anymore, I don't feel something's good for me, I will start to literally die on the inside. And that's something I know about myself. If I don't like the people I'm around, if I don't respect the people I'm around, which is what started to happen for me here in Austin, then I do start to really like I get destructive with myself. So I would rather be what appears to be destructive with the outside world, which really, if you honestly look at it, I haven't done anything destructive with the outside world or with the people that I used to hang out with. I was very honest about the way that I was being treated in certain situations or the way that I saw certain situations and the way that I think certain people are messing up and all of that. I still feel that that's the way that and I feel like that those people needed to hear that and I feel like I needed to say that and I feel like I needed to completely separate myself from that. So while other people may judge me for that my only response to that would be i've seen the amount of talent that most of you are dealing with and you are completely right to stay on the beaten path and do exactly as you're told and if people tell you to stop talking to me you should stop talking to me you shouldn't be seen around me because your level of talent does dictate that you should definitely color by numbers but I, ladies and gentlemen, will continue to stay unbothered. Thank you for watching.